I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly. Global concern, escalating tension in the war in Ukraine as a U.S. embassy closes and the Biden administration authorizes the use of landmines against Russia. We have reports from the White House and the Vatican. Catholic on trial. Pro-democracy advocate Jimmy Lai testifies in his national security case in Hong Kong. Christian persecution. Learn more about a global initiative that shines a new light on churches, monuments, and buildings. Plus, save the date. The Vatican makes a major announcement regarding the canonization of two young Catholics beloved for their vibrant faith. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us tonight. We begin in Ukraine as that nation continues battling Russia. The Biden administration signs off on a second major policy shift, this time involving landmines. It comes just after the United States decided to let Ukraine strike targets deeper inside of Russia with U.S.-made missiles. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin says the Biden administration will allow Ukraine to use American-supplied anti-personnel landmines to help it fight Russia. Show you built. Russia says it shot down Ukrainian drones over the Belgorod region of Russia. No direct hit, but debris from the drones caused damage in the area. And as the war continues, today U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, while attending meetings in Laos, tells reporters that Russian forces have changed their tactics on the battlefield. Thus, the new policy change on anti-personnel landmines. So that's what the Ukrainians are seeing right now. Uh, and they, they have a need for, for things that can help slow down uh, that effort on the part of the, of the uh, Russians. The U.S. already provides Ukraine with anti-tank landmines, and Russia has routinely used landmines in the war, but those do not become inert over time. The landmines that we would look to, to provide them uh, would be landmines that, uh, that are not persistent. You know, we can, we can control when they would uh, self, self-activate, self-detonate. The announcement comes two months before Donald Trump moves back into the White House. He pledged to swiftly end the war and criticize the amount the U.S. has spent on supporting Ukraine. Biden administration officials say they are determined to help Ukraine as much as possible before Joe Biden leaves office. Meanwhile, the U.S. and some other Western embassies in Kyiv stayed closed today after a threat of a major Russian aerial attack. The U.S. State Department addressed the closure. We expect the embassy to be to return to normal operations tomorrow. I can't get into the obviously the specifics of the threat, uh, but it's something that we always monitor closely. Uh, we take the safety and security of our personnel very, uh, uh, it's very important to us. We take it uh, extremely seriously, and that's what led to the change in posture today. Now back to the landmines. Earlier this year, Pope Francis called landmines, quote, insidious. I asked the State Department to respond to that today, and they told me Ukraine has committed to only use the mines in non-civilian areas, and that the mines will soon be inert. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. All right, thank you so much, Owen. And as Owen mentioned, the Vatican also weighed in on the war in Ukraine. Pope Francis sent a letter to express his solidarity with all Ukrainians, along with his hopes and prayers for peace. This comes as Italian Cardinal Matteo Zuppi, who has served as the Pope's peace emissary to Ukraine, celebrates Mass in Rome, marking 1,000 days since the war began. EWTN Vatican correspondent Colin Flynn has more. Good evening, Tracy. Pope Francis met with the wife of Ukrainian President Zelensky, First Lady Olena Zelenska, this morning at the Vatican. She sat in the front row of the weekly general audience where Pope Francis acknowledged that a thousand days have now passed since the war in Ukraine started, which he said was a tragic milestone for the victims and for the destruction it has caused. He said that this war was a shameful tragedy for all of humanity. The Pope went on to read a letter he had received from a Ukrainian university student in which the young man said he had witnessed too much death in his life and that he was living in a city where missiles kill and injure dozens of people. He said it was hard to see so many tears. Pope Francis encouraged people to remain with the Ukrainian people and to pray for peace. 
After the Pope had spoken, the Ukrainian First Lady approached the platform in the middle of St. Peter's Square to greet the pontiff. But the pair had already met privately inside the Apostolic Palace earlier that morning. They had a private conversation that lasted around 30 minutes where they exchanged gifts. This evening in Rome at 5 p.m. local time, a special Mass for Peace was held at the Basilica of Santa Maria in Trastevere, which was celebrated by Cardinal Matteo Zuppi. Attended by the Ukrainian First Lady and Ukrainian Ambassador to the Holy See, Cardinal Zuppi in his homily said that not only was the death and physical destruction enormous, but also the spiritual suffering too. He said that this was a suffering which would last forever. But he encouraged people in what he called the dark night to look for the light and an end to the war. He said that working for peace was wise and not weak. He also said that stopping was not losing. He called for, quote, an end to the madness and a commitment to lasting peace. But he insisted that the church would not abandon the Ukrainian people. This mass comes at a time of increasing tensions between Russia and Ukraine, with many around the world worried that this war could escalate even further. In Rome, Colm Flynn, EWTN News Nightly. And we go to Hong Kong now. For the first time, media mogul Jimmy Lai has taken the stand in his landmark trial. Jimmy Lai, a Catholic, was arrested in 2020 for his involvement in a pro-democracy movement. He's accused of operating with foreign forces to conspire against the government, part of the Beijing-backed national security law. The trial is not just being talked about in China, but also here in the United States on Capitol Hill. How sad it is how they have mistreated this great man of principle. He could have left any time he wanted, given his wealth. He wanted to fight for his fellow friends and, and, and citizens in Hong Kong. And for that, uh, for speaking truth to power, in this case, a dictatorship, uh, he, is being, he is being very, very much maligned and unfortunately hurt uh, by the judicial corrupt system. All right, for more, let's bring in Bill McGurn with The Wall Street Journal. He is also Jimmy Lai's godfather. Bill, great to be with you. Uh, first off, your thoughts on what Congressman Smith had to say. Oh, he's, he's absolutely right. Um, Jimmy Lai is being singled out because he owned a newspaper that tried to tell the truth about what's going on in Hong Kong. And as uh, Congressman Smith pointed out, he could have uh, run away. He has houses all over the world. But he stood and went to jail for his principles. Today was a big day because the pressure on Jimmy, like all the people arrested in Hong Kong for these political crimes, is to plead guilty. But Jimmy doesn't believe he did anything wrong. He's correct in that. And he wants to have his say in court, even if it's biased against him. So his this today is the first time we've heard from Jimmy the trial began in January. This is the first time we've heard his voice. And the government hates that because uh, Jimmy's obviously sincere. He's very charismatic. He's a real champion of freedom. And ordinary Hong Kong people appreciate that. Yeah. And Bill, can you tell us what happened at the trial today and who was there? Well, he. Um, what happened is he was brought in to testify. There's a usual crowd. The remarkable thing about today, I think, from my point of view, uh, because of my closest with the Lai family, you know, a lot of people that ate at the Lai's dinner table and were friends with them before abandoned him uh, once he got in trouble. The one man who didn't is Cardinal Zen. And when Jimmy walked into the courtroom today, and saw Cardinal Zen sitting next to his wife, Teresa, it must have really lifted his spirits. Um, it's a tremendous thing. I give Cardinal Zen great credit. He also showed up yesterday to the sentencing of 45 other Democrats, not as well known, but are equally brave. Yeah, it was so wonderful to get that support from him. Um, as we know, this trial hinges upon these accusations against Jimmy, such as conspiring with foreign agents, even uh, former Vice President Mike Pence and former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Jimmy has denied the allegations of foreign collusion. That said, Bill, what kind of evidence do they supposedly have against him? Well, that's the thing. The uh, government, since they arrested him, they've treated him like Osama bin Laden. Uh, put him in chains. Right here, 
I have a picture of Jimmy when he's arrested and he's uh, being led away, handcuffed, later had chains on him. They treat him like he's this great th threat. And he's a newspaper man. He does what ordinary publishers do. He talks to leaders all the time. The government exposed what a thin case they have. And now they're worried because he's so charismatic what he's going to say on the stand. Even without a script, Jimmy is very eloquent and very persuasive when he talks about freedom. Yeah, Bill, we're not a whole lot of time left, but um, very close to the family and Jimmy, obviously. Um, what can you tell us? How, how is his family doing? And how is he doing? Well, I, I I don't know how he's exactly doing. I don't think he's beaten in prison, but he's in solitary. He's a diabetic. He's 76. The Chinese have to worry about whether he dies in court. Look, his whole family is suffering from this. Uh, his wife, Teresa, is a rock. Just a rock. Um of faith and Jimmy draws strength from her because she has her husband in jail and her three kids scattered around the world and she's keeping it all together. So it's a real inspiration. You know, we think of these stories um, of saints that have withstood all this persecution as belonging to the Middle Ages. It's going on right now and we can see it. Absolutely, we can, and we are praying for Jimmy and his family. Bill, thank you thank so you. much. We appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you. You too. Well, the United States has vetoed a U.N. resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, an action which Hamas says proves the, quote, direct involvement of the United States in the war. Meanwhile, more than a dozen were killed from Israeli airstrikes in the Gaza Strip today, including women and children. It comes as Israel pushes ahead with fighting Hezbollah to its north. Multiple soldiers were killed in an airstrike targeting an army post in Lebanon. The U.S. has been trying to broker a ceasefire deal to stop the fighting in Lebanon. The leader of Hezbollah says they support the ongoing negotiation process, but has some reservations on the current ceasefire proposal. All right, back here in the United States in Washington, members of the House Ethics Committee met behind closed doors to discuss whether to publicly release a report detailing their investigation into former Congressman Matt Gates, President-elect Donald Tr Trump's pick for attorney general. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has the latest on the report and reaction. Eric. Well, Tracy, after a day-long meeting behind closed doors, ethics committee members left tight-lipped. Many of them wouldn't even say of how they're voted if they're going to release the report. Now, ethics committee chairman, Republican Michael Guest, left the meeting. We ended up chasing him down the street, and he did tell us that the committee was unable to reach an agreement on releasing the report. He said that he has not spoken to Gates either. Now, Congresswoman Susan Wild, the top Democrat on the ethics committee, said that the report should be released to the public, along with the House Democrats who wrote the committee. Meanwhile, Matt Gates was up on Capitol Hill today meeting with the Senate Judiciary Committee members. They're the ones who are going to be handling his confirmation hearing. I spoke with several of them as they left the meeting with Gates inside the Capitol. I do want to let our viewers know that cameras are only allowed in certain places of the Capitol, so I can only use my phone to get audio interviews. But here's what Senator Mike Lee had to say. He said that the um Allegations that under, are under consideration by the committee are false, and that the same allegations were thoroughly investigated for years by the Department of Justice. So is he calling this a political ploy against him? Yes. Yeah. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but... I think that is a fair characterization of how he would put it. For more than two years, the Department of Justice probed sexual misconduct allegations against Gates, as well as allegations of drug use and obstruction of justice before clearing him last year of any wrongdoing. Gates continues to deny all the claims. Speaker Mike Johnson has said releasing the report about a former congressman would set a dangerous precedent. But a check and Venmo payments obtained by the Ethics Committee appear to show that then-Congressman Matt Gates paid more than $10,000 to two women who testified that some of the payments were for sex. Other Republican senators whose votes are critical for confirmation want to know more. I was shocked by the nomination uh, given the many allegations, but that's why it's important that the Senate go through its process of making sure that we have a background check. I want the Judiciary Committee to be able to see it 
prior to the hearings. And then after that, depending on what happens, then of course it could be released to, to, the, um, to the other members that are going to at some point have a vote. Late this afternoon, Congressman Sean Kasten, a Democrat from Illinois, says that he does plan to introduce a motion requiring the full House to vote to force the Ethics Committee to release the report. Now, the timing of this motion is uncertain based on the Ethics Committee actions today. Several Democrats expressed that President-elect Donald Trump may use a recess appointment to get Matt Gates in as Attorney General. As we know, a recess appointment authorizes a sitting president to make a temporary appointment when the Senate has not met in session for more than 10 days. The uh, committee plans to meet again in December. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Okay, thank you, Eric, for that. Meanwhile, President-elect Trump is pushing ahead, selecting more people to serve in his administration. Today, Trump announced that he is choosing former acting Attorney General Matt Whitaker to serve as U.S. Ambassador to NATO. The President-elect says Whitaker will strengthen relationships with NATO and allies, NATO allies, and, quote, stand firm in the face of threats to peace and stability. This comes on the heels of Trump picking professional wrestling mogul Linda McMahon as Education Secretary and Dr. Mehmet Oz to oversee the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. We have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly. Across the world, churches are uniting for an important cause. Why monuments and churches are turning red to shine a light on a global problem. And the Pope makes a surprise announcement at the end of his general audience about two canonizations. new law to make all public school classrooms post the Ten Commandments remains blocked after decision today from a federal appeals court in New Orleans. The law was signed in June, prompting a group of parents of different faiths to sue. Earlier this month, a U.S. district judge ruled the law was overtly religious and therefore unconstitutional. Today, the appeals court appeals rejected a state request to stay the order. While a new report finds that in recent years in Europe, there have been nearly 2,500 documented hate crimes against Christians. According to the report, nearly half of the documented attacks were in France. It also states that anti-Christian hate crimes in England and Wales rose to more than 700. Germany saw a staggering increase of 105 percent between 2022 and 2023. Of the hate crimes reported, there were about 84 attacks against individuals. All this comes amid the annual commemoration of a global initiative to highlight persecuted Christians. Today is Red Wednesday, and hundreds of cathedrals, churches, monuments, and public buildings line up in red. It is part of the annual campaign by the Papal Foundation Aid to the Church in Need. It launched in 2016 to shed light on Christian persecution and emphasize the importance of religious freedom as a fundamental human right. And joining us now to talk more about this is Ed Clancy, Director of Outreach for Aid to the Church in Need. Ed, always great to have you on the show. So tell us more about the initiative and how many countries took part this year. Uh, well, we have uh, 23 national offices, and I think about uh, 20 of them have participate in some significant way. Yeah, and Ed, uh, as we mentioned, this began back in 2016, um, but there's something different this year. Tell us a little bit more about that and the relationship with the Church of England. Well, this year, I mean, there, primarily what has happened is that Christian persecution has increased across the world. And so each year that we do this, we try to highlight that. So in th this year, you know, following our report, Persecuted and Forgotten, which highlights, you know, some of these problems, uh, we're trying to draw the light on that. And in the UK, there's been a good deal of participation by both churches and the parliament. So we have had uh, a great success in the UK, and hopefully we can have that in more countries. Yeah, and Ed, is there a significance to having Red Wednesday in November? Well, the connection was uh, in contrast to originally Black Friday, that everybody was focusing on purchasing things and leading into a Christmas season that really isn't solemn uh, or you know preparatory. And that was the initial effort, and also to link it with the, the uh, Wednesday before Christ the King, when Jesus Christ, we honor Jesus Christ as King, and there are many places around the world where Christians can't do that where in fact they're subjugated and they're they're terrorized just for that Christian faith. 
Yeah, and give us a snapshot of some of those places around the world where Christian persecution uh, is really high and on the rise. Well, unfortunately, it's the usual suspects. We have countries like Pakistan, Nigeria. In fact, all of the Sahel region, India has seen an uptick. And other countries where there is a good number of Christians, like Egypt, we see things like uh, abduction of young women and uh, essentially sexual slavery. Uh, this is happening in, in too many places. And unfortunately, one in seven people, one in seven Christians in the world live in some sort of uh, persecution. Yeah, I mean, you do so much to raise awareness for this. What else can we do as the faithful? Well, I pray always for, for them, support them. And I would advocate that you, the uh, viewers would go to our website and download the report, Persecuted and Forgotten, so they could be more knowledgeable and they could talk about it with the, their friends and uh, church and have a more focused effort of prayer. Yeah, Ed, thank you so much for coming on. Always appreciate it. Thank you for what you do. God bless. You're welcome, and God bless you and everyone. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, Pope Francis is making a change. What he is doing to make his funeral different than other popes. Plus, two young people, very popular among young Catholics, are becoming saints. When they'll be canonized, we'll tell you next. Welcome back. Pope Francis has revised the funeral rites that will be used when he dies. He has simplified the rituals to emphasize his role as a shepherd and disciple of Christ while also allowing for burial outside the Vatican. The Holy Father has expressed his desire to be buried in the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome and not underneath St. Peter's Basilica where most popes are buried. Well, a busy day at the Vatican, Pope Francis announces a summit for the rights of children and new details on two new canonizations. During his weekly talk to pilgrims, the Holy Father said that the Vatican will host a world meeting on children's rights in February. There is also new details on canonizations. Blessed Carlo Acutis will be canonized in late July at the Jubilee of Teenagers. And Pier Giorgio Frazzati is said to be canonized at the Jubilee of Youth between July 28th and August 3rd. Well, for analysis, we turn now to Dr. Matthew Bunsen, Vice President and Editorial Director for EWTN News. Matthew, always great to have you. Great to be here, especially uh, with such great news today. Very, very exciting, yep. for sure. Um, what has been the reaction to the dates uh, being finalized? And is it unusual for this announcement to come as a surprise? Well, it's been anticipated for a long time, really since uh, the beatification of Carlo Acutis uh, not that long ago, uh, and also to add in Pier Giorgio Frassati. These are two truly beloved saints. I, I think that uh, Carlo Acutis has been especially uh, a figure of deep love and admiration uh, for a number of years now, as we can attest from the, the visits, the pilgrims who are flocking to his tomb in Assisi. So it's not necessarily a surprise, because we had a sense that it was going to be in the Jubilee year. We also had a reasonably reliable sense that this is going to be probably during the uh, Jubilee for Youth and Jubilee for Teens, and that's exactly sort of how it's played out. So on the one hand, it wasn't a huge shock, but I think there's a sense of relief and, and real joy that the announcement was made by the Holy Father. Yeah, it's really bringing a lot of joy to so many, especially the young people. And remind us why these two saints are so beloved by young people. Well, with uh, Carlo Acutis, we have uh, the, the, a great millennial saint. Uh, he died in, what, 2006 uh, from leukemia at a very young age. He was uh, a, a great saint, uh, I use that term in anticipation of the canonization, of the Internet age. Uh, he developed websites uh, on the Eucharistic miracles. So this is a young man who understood modernity, but who also understood eternity. Uh, that he gave his life from the earliest times to Christ uh, and wanted to convert, so to speak, uh, what Pope Benedict XVI always called the digital continent, the Internet. But the other thing that is striking about Carlo Acutis is that he was just like every other kid. Yeah. Uh, he, he's, he's buried in his sneakers. Uh, I know that's some controversy in a few corners. But this is a, a child who died loving Christ with the sacraments, uh, and he's a reminder that sanctity can come at any age. Pier Giorgio Frassati, who died in 1925, I think at the age of 24, is similar, but in his case, it was a life of action. Uh, he was a mountain climber. He was very active, uh, not just in sports, but he was really active in Catholic social teaching. So he was out there as a young man caring for the poor, helping 
in the aftermath of World War I, those who had been so brutally wounded and left scarred by it. He was active uh, in the, the Third Order Dominicans. He was active in, in prayer. He was active in his community. So as a young man, uh, he gave himself to Christ, but through a life of action in the world. So they're, they're a very interesting pair, uh, but they're both young. And they're a reminder that we are all called, especially young people, to Christ. Such wonderful examples, almost out of time. But anything yeah. you'd like to mention about the canonization mass? Well, I think uh, we can anticipate they're going to be incredibly well attended. Uh, I'll say in fairness, I think especially Carlo Wacuti says, because there is so much uh, excitement, there's buzz about his canonization. But let's remember that this is also nested within the Jubilee. Uh, so we're going to have a year full of events in Rome. They expect about 30 million people to show up in all of these different events. So you can download the app uh, for the Jubilee year. We're going to be very active in covering it at EWTN, EWTN News. So the fact that the Holy Father wanted to do this within the Jubilee, but then marking in the Jubilee year something for youth, something for teens, uh, that, that's a statement, too. Uh, that young people have an important role in the church, and they're going to be given this special moment. Uh, and what a better way uh, to celebrate that moment than with two new saints. Absolutely. Matthew, thank you so much. We appreciate it. God bless. Great to be with you. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night, and God bless.